Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Calls Calls. This is the 2024 Arnold Palmer Invitational DFS Tactics Show. We have everything you need to finalize and optimize your lineups for the next uh, signature event on the PGA Tour. The most up to the second forecast per win finder, the most up to date ownership projections, all of that good stuff that you need to win this week. Uh, so we have a lot to cover. Don't want to waste any time. Let's get straight into it. All statistics provided tonight and every night are from FantasyNational.com. It is the best golf analytics tool out there for your money. It's going to make you a much smarter golf gambler and a much better golf DFS player. Go check out FantasyNational.com. It is well worth your investment. In the description to the video, there are links to all the social media. First off, my ex and Instagram where I posted research earlier this week for both the Arnold Palmer and the Puerto Rico Open. So if you want to see the weekly research that I do uh, on the PGA Tour, then give me a follow at your preferred social media site, uh, X or Instagram. X is also where I place my betting cards and my top player usage in the DFS contest that I play. That'll come out uh, after the show this evening for both the Arnold Palmer and the Puerto Rico Open. So if you want to see that, give me a follow over at X as well. And then lastly, for social media, Gabe's handle is in the description. He writes a very good article called The Fringe. Uh, and if you are a subscriber to his article, you're already going to know that you're able to join us in his Substack chat uh, after Calls Calls and the DFS Tactics show every Wednesday as we continue the DFS talk over in his Substack chat. He is gracious enough to host me over there and we continue the DFS talk uh, as we finalize our lineups and get prepared for the week. Uh, so go show Gabe some support, follow him over, over on social media, and subscribe to that article. Again, it is free to do, by the way, and you're going to be able to join us in his Substack chat. Lastly, we are live. Chat is open. want to hear from you all. In addition to the poll question, which I've got typed up, ready to go, I want to hear who your winner for the Arnold Palmer is, who are you focused on this week, who's your favorite player um, to play in DFS, who are you fading away from, uh, pivoting to all that good stuff. So let's figure out our strategies and our tactics for the 2024 Arnold Palmer Invitational. And we're going to start with the updated Windfinder forecast. Before that, very quickly, uh, I'll, I'll share the poll question. When there are two tournaments in a week, how much attention do you pay to the alternate event? So perhaps... Um, not directly uh, related to the Arnold Palmer, uh, but I am curious from uh, the community, uh, how much attention do you pay to the alternate field event uh, whenever there are two tournaments in a week? Um, four options, a lot, a decent amount, very little, or there's another tournament? <laughs> so would love to hear uh, the community's input on that. Um, if you are unaware, I do uh, a full show for every alternate event. Those are on Tuesday nights, so that is out live now from last night. But we are here for the Arnold Palmer Invitational, and the updated forecast looks pretty decent for Thursday and Friday. You see Thursday, very, very little wind, which is a little bit of a surprise. Uh, now, I would expect the wind to kind of pick pick up in the afternoon it generally does here but at least per the forecast i do not see too much uh wind here in the forecast here at wind finder for tomorrow now friday's a different matter friday looks very gusty in the morning perhaps a little bit of rain in the afternoon uh, but the wind does look like it t uh, falls off in the afternoon so Last week I was incorrect at the cognizant that that turned out there turned out to be a, a decent little wave advantage uh, per um, what we were talking about last night with the uh, forecast. Again, this week I would not pay too much attention, or at least I'm not going to factor in too much of an advantage uh, on either half of the draw, uh, especially since this is a uh, limited field event and a limited cut event. Um, most of the players are going to make uh, the cut. Um, so I don't see too much of an advantage. 
I would not argue with you if you wanted to say that the players who are playing late on Friday have the best advantage, um, especially since Thursday looks pretty darn even. And Friday, they are definitely getting the better half, at least per the forecast. But I still think that the wind will probably pick up a little bit more in the afternoon than what is uh, expected or, or at least forecasted here. Now, if we zoom out and take a look at the weekend, Saturday and Sunday look like uh, havoc. Um, Bay Hill is traditionally tough with the wind picking up as it is projected on Saturday and Sunday, it really looks like the, uh, the weekend is going to play extremely difficult. But for our intents and purposes, trying to get 6-6 six six through for the cut, I would not um, favor any particular half of the draw. Might use it as a tiebreaker. I would not argue if you wanted to say that the last bit of the Friday afternoon uh, portion of the tea times had the best of it. I wouldn't argue with you on that. I'm just not going to factor it in too much in my decision making. So with that, we're going to move to Fantasy National. And the um, players this week, we're going to do a quick review. Apologies, let me unstart these players as I was gathering ownership projections um, basically up to the last minute for you. Um so let me unstar these for you, and that should be it. I need to add the moderate and windy filter for this week. Now, it looks like the players in the field this week have enough rounds to make this statistically significant, except for maybe Pavone, Valamaki, and Dunlap, which they wouldn't have a lot of rounds if we went to two years anyway. <coughs> so in the last 12 months... In moderate and windy conditions, your top players in the wind have been Scotty Scheffler, Victor, Patrick Cantley, Denny McCarthy, Xander, Wyndham Clark, Justin Rose, Rory, Ricky Fowler, and Corey Connors. The other end of the spectrum, players who have not been good in the wind in the field this week at the API, Tom Hoagie, Seamus Power, EVR. Again, a little surprising considering he's generally pretty good in the wind, but at least in the last 36 rounds, uh, my guess is it's this moderate that has caused him to crater. Uh, but generally, he's pretty good in the wind, so be, be aware of that. Um, Webb Simpson, Tom Kim, Mackenzie Hughes, Justin Lauer, Will Zalatoris, Kirk Kitayama, Jake Knapp, so on down in that order. So there's a look at your top and bottom or best and worst wind performers because of the wind that is forecasted, especially throughout the weekend, I am very, very confident this is going to play difficult. Um, so your top players, when rounds are difficult relative to par in the past either 12 months or 36 rounds, Scotty, Rory, Victor Hovland, Wyndham Clark, Tommy Fleetwood, Patrick Cantley, Xander, Jordan Spieth, Ricky Fowler, and Min Woo Lee are your top 10 in that regard. The other end of the spectrum, Tom Hoagie, Webb Simpson, Justin Thomas, Mackenzie Hughes, Grayson Murray, Nick Dunlap, Seamus Power, Luke List, Lee Hodges, Adams Vincent, and so on. Those are your bottom or worst performers when rounds are difficult. We could look at long course as well, but we've, we've done that throughout the week um, and we've got a lot to cover, uh, mixed condition model and, and ownerships and whatnot. So, Let's go ahead and just go straight to the mixed condition model that I have made for the Arnold Palmer this week. We're going to start with 15% in off the tee. Now, I did use the scoring uh, or difficult scoring relative to par filter. Uh, you could have used long courses, um, maybe difficult fairways to hit, uh, but I just chose to go with the difficult relative to par because I feel like this is going to play a lot like a major. It typically does. Uh, and so I wanted to see who was the best off the tee in those situations. Uh, that way they are not taking themselves out of the hole immediately. Since there is some uh, water uh, in play off the tee. Not as much as at the Cognizant last week. But there is still water in play. 
So you're going to have to be accurate. Distance does help, but it's a lot about the accuracy. So 15% in off the tee when it's difficult. 15% in strokes gain approach. I've talked about it all week. I just think, I, I, I think of Bay Hill, I think of ball striking. Around the green will matter. We'll talk about that here in a second. But I just, I just think about ball striking a lot. So 15% in strokes gain approach. 5% in around the green. And I did use the long rough filter. I know it wasn't great in last year's mixed condition model. But Bay Hill is notorious for its, for its long rough, especially uh, if you are um, wayward off the tee and uh, what causes you to miss some greens or if you're missing greens, which you're going to miss greens, they're difficult to hit here. You're going to have to be pretty good around the green to get around here with Bay Hill and scramble for your pars. So I wanted to run it back and see if last year was just a little bit of, a, of an outlier or a bit misleading. So 5% in around the green, look, you could use difficult to par here. You could just use 5% in straight up around the green. Wouldn't um, blame you for that, but I did want to see uh, with the long rough, since Bay Hill is notorious for how long its rough is. 5% on Tiff Eagle Bermuda. Now I made a pretty strong point of this uh, Monday night that if players had played the Cognizant, they were generally really good putting, or at least in prior years, if they had played the Honda, or played at PGA National, and then played Bay Hill, since both of those courses are Tiff Eagle, pure Tiff Eagle, generally speaking, if they putt well at um, the Honda, they would come back and they would win. Or at least your former champions of Bay Hill had putt extremely well if they played at Honda. So that's why, that's why I'm factoring in putting. I only have it 5% because I am going back all the way to two years, not just the recency bias of the Cognizant, but all um, you know, all rounds on Tiff Eagle in the past two years. So that's why it's only at 5%. But I would give a pretty decent boost to the players that putt extremely well at the Cognizant. Think of Eric Van Royen. Austin Eckroat, Matt Fitzpatrick, Russell Henley put daylights out at the Cognizant. Uh, there are plenty of others, uh, and I, I showed you that on Monday night. So if you're uh, interested in that, go check out uh, that information um, after the show tonight. So 5% in putting on Tiff Eagle Bermuda, uh, and that's what the filter is, just the multiple courses that have Tiff Eagle Bermuda. 10% in good drives gained. Again, when scoring is difficult. Uh, we know Bay Hill is generally difficult. I think it's going to be very difficult, especially over the weekend. So I want to see the players that are finding the fairway or uh, aren't so wayward or good enough or are good enough from the rough that they can still hit these greens in regulation. So that's what a good drive gained is defined in Fantasy National. 5% in birdies gained when it's difficult. 5% in bogeys avoided. When it's difficult, I really thought I was gonna, um, you know, put the bogey avoidance at ten percent, like we talked about Monday night. Um, but as I looked at it, um, the bogey avoidance has has diminished in its importance the past four to five years. So we're going to take an equal look at birdies and bogeys gained and avoided. Uh, and see what happens this year. Um, these were clearly the last bits of the mixed condition model. Um, so I didn't want to put a whole lot of, of emphasis into them. So 5% in each of those. Rounding out the mixed condition model, 200 plus proximity. That is the range of irons that you just have to be good at here at Bay Hill with the par fives, which you have to take advantage of. All of them are over, or three of the four are over 550 yards. So if the players are attacking those par fives and two, they're going to be approaching in 200 plus. Uh, you've got several longer par fours as well. So 200 plus is a major factor around Bay Hill. 10% in par threes, 200 to 225. I've talked all week how stubborn I am that I believe this is the range of par threes that really needs to narrowly be focused. So 10% there, 10% in all of par fours. Didn't feel comfortable splitting out a particular range. And then 
in the par fives measuring 550 to 600. Again, three of the four par fives measured to that length on the scorecard. So there's a look at the mixed condition model that I've made for the API this week. Um, look, if around the green or putting happens to be more important, uh, perhaps distance, if distance matters quite a bit, um, I don't have anything uh, directly related to distance other than just off the tee. I am more focused on the accuracy um, aspect this week. Um, if birdies or bogeys uh, matter more, if there's a particular range of par four, but um, those are where I could be weak uh, in terms of the bias to, in my mixed condition model, uh, but feel, feel pretty strongly. Again, I've just been focused on the ball striking and the accuracy this week. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and go to Microsoft Excel, the reveal of my rankings. Go as such, Patrick Cantley, actually my number one player this week. Rory, number two, Scotty Scheffler, third, Cam Young and Victor Hovland, four, uh, fourth and fifth, rounding out the top five. Jordan Spieth, Tommy Fleetwood, Matt Fitzpatrick, Keegan and Max Homa round out my top 10. And I mentioned this quite a bit on Monday, or at least uh, at the end of the show Monday, you look at all of these extremely low course values up here in my top 10. Bay Hill is one of the most predictive courses for success year over year on the PJ Tour. Uh, talked about this quite a bit in the Data Dive Show, at the end of the Data Dive Show, showing you the prior winners of Bay Hill and how much success they had had leading into the uh, to their championship win. So, for uh, for or as an, a reminder for returning viewers, for your information, if you're a new viewer, my rankings go on three criteria: the F and GC rank, which is a pure analytics uh, ranking based on the mixed condition model we just talked about, all of the metrics and filters. Uh, in that model, FNGC will split out a ranking. My course value, which is um, an attempt at giving a player a numerical value on how well they have played that course in the past five years. The lower the number, the better. And of course, we are playing DFS, so projected ownership, and this is per Fantasy National. Projected ownership also factors in to my rankings. So with that, uh, hey P, good evening. Thanks for jumping in chat. Uh, it's good to see you two nights in a row. Um, glad to see you for the Puerto Rico and now for the main event, if you will, for the week, the Arnold Palmer, where the majority of um, the money in the contests are. But good to see you in chat this evening. Uh, much appreciated. Um, Gabe was uh, or is kind enough to share with me his um, source of. Uh, ownership, so I have that off to the side over here as well. So we have two sources of um, ownerships that we can look at. Um, but as far as my rankings, look, my top 10, again, there's no surprise. I have an extreme amount of weight here in this course value of the, the um, quality that a player has played Bay Hill in the past five years. Uh, it's, it's a bigger weight than what it normally is. So a lot of emphasis here. No real surprise, I don't think. Uh, Jordan Spieth only played Bay Hill twice, but it's been very good, as you see. Perhaps a little surprising, or at least I was a little, uh, a little surprised seeing Cantlay number one. But considering you are pretty darn close to 10% per Fantasy National in uniqueness, and you're closer to 15% uniqueness per Gabe source, you're getting a lot of ownership discount uh, on Patrick Cantley, so that's why he is leapfrogging Scotty and Rory in my rankings. Because you see, by Fantasy National, and by, or at least by the numbers purely, he's still fourth, still very strong. He's only played Bay Hill once, but he did top five it last year. Nothing to the levels of sustained success like Rory and Scotty have um, year over year. But Cantley has played it once, played it well, and... Um, with all that ownership discount, uh, that's why he is rising. Cameron Young played Bay Hill very well as, uh, as well. Victor Hovland. Uh, I'm a little surprised Fitzpatrick's 
as low as he is, he was only 24th. By the numbers, uh, the irons have not been the greatest. And then he is second to last in this field. 68th out of 69 in par fours. So that's what's really hurting him, dropping him down to 24th uh, by the numbers. Eighth for me because he's been fantastic at Bay Hill. Uh, so enough of my rankings. No, Again, no real shock on who is in the top 10. You can always argue the ordering. But let's sort on the price board, figure out where our fellow contestants are going in these various price ranges and see where we can maneuver around them. So in the five digits, in the 10Ks, we have three players, Scotty at 11.3, Rory at 10.6, and Patrick Cantley at 10,000 even. As we talked about, Patrick Cantley is about 10 to 15% projected uniqueness off of Rory and Scotty. Um, all three of these, you know, one, two, three in my rankings. Now, Fantasy National has uh, these players, you know, 22% or so per Gabe source. They're much closer to 30%. I'm going to lean towards the 30%. I just think that uh, most of our fellow contestants are choosing between Scotty and Rory, which means as much as uh, as unpopular of a player as Patrick Cantley is, I'm probably going to make Cantley number one, like my rankings, because of the uniqueness factor. When we looked at performance in the wind, total performance in the wind, total performance when it's difficult, he was top 10 in both of those regards as well. Uh, he's fourth in uh, the pure analytic numbers as well. He's fine off the tee. He's not going to take himself out of the hole. He's, he's a grinder, gets his pars, and pars are good scores around Bay Hill. He does struggle a little bit with his 200-plus proximity, which is really lagging behind the other two. But the other two have their flaws as well. Uh, you see Scotty Scheffler is one of the worst players in this field, specifically at these very long par threes, 200 to 225 par threes. Uh, Rory has been really bad. On Tiff Eagle Bermuda. He lost three and a half strokes last week at the Cognizant alone. So uh, each of these three players has um, has some has, has some red statistics or something that is uh, that is not good for them. Based on the cheaper price and the amount of uniqueness. Now, if it was only five percent uniqueness off of the other two probably would feel a little bit different, but going 10 to 15% uniqueness from Patrick Cantlay to the other two, I'm going to make Patrick Cantlay my number one player. Uh, I, I just give me the uniqueness factor, and I'm still very confident that he's going to play well this week. He's only played it one time, yes, but it was very good last year. I will make Scotty number two. Um, yes, the par threes could be an issue, but... For as bad of, uh, as his putter has been, he's actually been acceptable on Tiff Eagle Bermuda, whereas Rory, you saw, I mean, yes, he was in contention last week, but losing three and a half strokes, that is, that's a massive amount. And he's generally not good on that surface anyway. So when you have two equally strong ball strikers, first and second off the tee, First and and Rory's, Rory's irons that are you know top thirty they're much better than this. Um, when you have two pretty equal ball strikers, give me the guy that's acceptable putting on this surface uh, as opposed to continuously showing that he's really really bad on it. So I'll make Scheffler second and I'll make Rory third in the ten Ks. But I, I'm still going to use all three of these. But I am going to use the m most of Patrick Cantley based off of the amount of uniqueness you're gaining on your fellow contestants. Good evening, Darnell. Thanks for jumping in chat. Much appreciated. Hopefully, um, we are ready to turn our luck around for the main event this week. The Arnold Palmer, it's good to see you this evening. So that's the way I see the 10Ks. Let's go to the nines. Um, all of these players inside the top 20 in my rankings as well. I'm actually the lowest on Colin Morikawa because he is generally not played the Arnold Palmer Invitational well at all. He does have a top 10, 
but he's got a missed cut. And last year, uh, he, he missed the cut last year at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. He's also got a, a like a 61st or maybe 63rd place finish a, a few years back. He generally has not played the Arnold Palmer very well. So this is an, an example of do you want to trust the analytics or do you want to trust the prior course performance? I'm going to go with the prior course performance because uh, everything analytically says he should be good. Number one in good drives gain, top five in irons. Uh, off the tee based on the accuracy but I'm going to go with the fact that he's just generally not played well here and I'm going to be out on Colin Morikawa so if he plays well I'll lose but just be aware and he has been pretty darn bad to, in two of the three years that he's played Bay Hill other places here in the 10Ks Hovland's going to be extremely chalky but for good reason he's played very well here um 20%, 20.5% for Gabe Source, 18% here. So you're looking, you know, at probably the third, maybe the fourth most owned player on the docket this week. Um, that's fine. Um, probably, probably a good play. Uh, he is, he has been bad on the longer par fives. I don't know how much I want to put into that. And the around the green is getting better. So just be aware, he is very, very. Uh, popular this week, but part of going to Cantley allows me to use a player like Hovland since I'm gaining so much uniqueness off of the other two and I can squeeze it in price wise easier as well. Xander, kind of lukewarm on Xander. Um, he's been fairly mediocre here. The off the tee can, can be a drag. Number two in irons behind only Scotty. Uh, very accurate. Uh, even if he is in the rough, he generally finds a way to hit the greens. Uh, pretty good, you know, decent enough putter on this surface. I'm just lukewarm on Xander. 19% per game source, 17 and a half here. It's a lot of ownership. I think I'm willing to go other places. And since he is so closely projected owned to Victor Hovland, I'm just going to go with Hovland. I'm much more confident in Hovland around Bay Hill than I am Xander. Obear. Probably going to be good, I would think, considering he's elite driving. But what I talk about a lot with Ludwig Obert, generally speaking, he has played his best when it's easy. And Bay Hill is not easy. That's why his off-the-tee game is showing as middling, considering it is factoring in, you know, difficult to par. Good drives gained, difficult to par, not very good. Now, number five or top five in the long par threes, number one, on par four, so a lot going for him. But this, it feels like it would be a good fit for Ludwig Ober. Just be aware that um, until he sustain has sustained success in difficult tournaments, I'm going to be a little bit cautious and be a little bit lower on Ober. Spieth, fine, I guess. Like he never rate generally rates out well. So the fact that he's sixth. I should be paying a lot more attention to. Like the irons just kind of scare me. The 200 plus is really bad. But he is the number one player on the long par fives. Number three and around the green. Um, he's played exceptionally well here. So it's probably a good play. I just, I can't get excited for a Jordan Spieth, but the fact that he is so highly rated in my rankings, I probably should take more notice. Burns, it's all about the putter for Sam Burns. He's number two on this surface behind Eric Cole. Bermuda Burns, like we talked about Bermuda Billy last week, it's Bermuda Burns. So you always got to factor him in that regard, but he can get extremely wayward. Home is going to be pretty good. This is one of the plays in the 9Ks that I really, really like. If I'm not around Morikawa, if I'm not as high on Xander, I'll be using a lot of Max Homa quite a bit. Yes, he didn't rate out particularly well. Um, kind of the inverse of Morikawa. Analytically, Morikawa is great, but has not played well here. Analytically, home is fine, 22nd out of 70. It, it's it's good. It's not elite. But home has been lights out here at Bay Hill. A couple of top 10s, another top 20 or two. So 
A lot to like with, with Max Homa. I'll be using him quite a bit. I'm on the fence with JT. Uh, I know, Darnell, you have uh, jokingly said that uh, that uh, he is never again <laughs> for you. I'm on the fence with it. Um, he's been okay here, but he's got some, some poor statistics for sure. You cannot doubt, uh, you cannot argue Justin Thomas's ability to scramble. So that's something you need to, to be aware of, but you got plenty of reasons to fade him. So in the 9Ks, look, I know he's going to be extremely chalky. I'm going to be able to justify Hovland. Um, oh, I know it wasn't a joke for you. Um, it was, he, he has been, uh, he has been the cause of your demise a couple of times here recently. <laughs> um, I'll be using a lot of Hovland uh, only because I'm going to be using a lot of Cantley, and that's where I'm going to gain my uniqueness um, from others in, in, you know, our fellow contestants. So I will be using a lot of Hovland. This is some chalk I'll eat. Um, Spieth should, I'm probably going to be using more Spieth than I'm comfortable with based on his, where he finished in the rankings and how well he's played here. And I will be using quite a bit of Max Homa. So if Max Homa, or I'll be overweight on Max Homa, I should say. I'll be having more than, you know, just 11% or 12% on Max Homa. So, um, you know, if Homa doesn't play well, I'll lose. Conversely, if Morikawa plays well, I will lose. I'm not going to be using much of Morikawa. Uh, I am scared about how uh, poor he's played Bay Hill. Uh, I'm going to be a lot lower on Xander this week than what the rating or ranking shows here. Uh, playing Rory and Scheffler along with um, Adam Scott, Luke List, and Cam Young. Um, you're going to be pretty darn chalky, but I don't hate that with the exception of Luke List. I, I don't like Luke List this week, but we'll get into him at the bottom of the sevens. Um, so there's a look at the nines. Let's go to the eights. Um, is that, a lot of people are gravitating towards Zalatoris. Okay, I guess. I mean, very good off the tee, especially when it's difficult. But you look at some of these metrics, and he's, he, some of them were when he was injured, sure. But you know, good drives gained, an issue. Not particularly good with these par fours. Has not been very good with this particular style of short game, long rough and on Tiff Eagle Bermuda. Um Seeing Zalatoris at 11.5 per game source, Fantasy National um, a little bit higher. I'm not as high on Will Zalatoris. Fantasy National is not um, high on Tommy Fleetwood, or at least the members there, only 10.5%, whereas 17% per game source. Probably going to be okay. Probably going to be okay. Much better than what this is showing. Here is around the green game is is great to elite even not the best putter on the surface but um, this is he's going to be closer to fifteen percent and that's why I'm just not as excited for Tommy Fleetwood I'll have some of Tommy Fleetwood um, but I, I'm thinking he's going to be closer to fifteen percent Cameron Young high projected ownership fine uh, you know elite off the team Corey Connors has been priced on Yahoo. Might play instead. Mm. Connors has been good here. I will say that. But I'm not in love with that one either. Um, Cam Young. Elite off the tee. The irons can be an issue. And he's bad on this surface. Although he gained last week at the Cognizant. So just be aware, like Victor Hovland, he is not going to be anywhere uh, near unique enough. You're going to have to find a lot of uniqueness if you're going to be using some Cam Young. But probably a decent play. He's also somebody that generally doesn't rate out well, so the fact that he is fourth, uh, I don't know. I love Matt Fitzpatrick again this week. I know he did. He was t uh, T21 or something last week. That doesn't scare me off at all. The irons are fine. He's not going to take himself out of the hole. The par fours... Could be an issue, sure, but his ability to scramble and just get pars 
when pars are good scores, you want to play Matt Fitzpatrick, and pars are really good scores around Bay Hill. I love me some Matt Fitzpatrick. 16% per Fantasy National, 15.5 per game source, so he's not nearly as unique as I would like him to be. I don't care. This is more chalk I'll eat. Um, you're going to see Matt Fitzpatrick quite a bit on social media later tonight with my betting card and with my top player usage. I just love everything about Matt Fitzpatrick. He's been fantastic here. Somebody who has not been fantastic here is Wyndham Clark. And to want no part of Wyndham Clark. I know it conceptually probably feels like a good Wyndham Clark course, uh, 15th analytically, but he's been really, really bad here. Um, just don't want any part of it. Hideki's been okay, but we saw that um, you know Sunday night in the uh, early look file, like Hideki struggles with the putter here. So scores has crazy history when it comes to prior play. Yes, that is why um, course value is extremely weighted this week. Extremely weighted. And that's why I don't want any part of Wyndham Clark. Uh, that's why I'm not particularly excited for Luke List. And I meant while I mentioned why I mentioned Connors has at least played well here. Um, Hideki's been fine, but I do worry about the putter here. This does not feel like a good Tom Kim Tom Kim fit. J Day's been very good here as well, but last in the field in irons. I mean, dead last in the field with irons. Um. I actually like Sahit Tagala, and yes, this course value is hideous. He did top 15 last year. Sahit Tagala did top 15 last year. So this number, he's only played it twice. So his first year was really, really bad, which you would expect. I I think Sahit Tagala is pretty sneaky this week, so I'm going to be overweight on Sahit Tagala. Uh, Luke Liss missed his last two cuts before. Very good. If you look at his cuts, missed 13 strokes putting. Don't see that happening again. Maybe not to that amount, but Luke Liss is just a bad putter. You know, if it was somebody even, you know, field average week in and week out, sure. But Luke Liss is, a, is notoriously one of the worst putters on tour. So it doesn't surprise me. We'll talk about him in the low sevens. Um, I'm just, I'm just not there. That there's more than just the putter that scares me. I'll put it that way. But the putter is bad enough. Um, so in the eight Ks, again, Fleetwood's fine. I just think he's going to be more than ten and a half percent. He's probably going to be more, closer to fifteen. Fleetwood's fine. I absolutely love Fitzpatrick again this week. So I'm going to use him. Cameron Young's fine. He's just not unique at all. Um, J-Day is, is interesting because of the elite court or prior course history. Uh, I'm going to use Tagala. It is quite speculative uh, considering uh, the poor course history. But again, he did top 15 this last year. So I'm going to use some C Tagala. I was really high on Sung Jay. He did not play well last week, so I'm I'm much more cautious about Sung Jay. But you see that course value. He's been exceptional here as well. So if you're really wanting to get unique, really take a strong look at Sung Jay. And I will casually mention Russell Henley, uh, even though he doesn't rate out very high. Um, he is supposedly the worst putter on this surface. He gained like five strokes last week at the Cognizant. So he at least does have the uh, spike ability to putt. Um, in the upper sevens, no thank you on posting. This I always target posting when it's shorter and it's easy. Last week it was short, so it, it kind of fit. This is not short. It is not easy. Not easy. You see the course value. He has not played well at Bay Hill. No thanks on JT Poston. Again, talking about Corey Connors, I mean, he just missed my top 10. He's been pretty darn good here, all based on the accuracy. The off the tee, when it's difficult, generally accurate. Top 5 and 200 plus irons. 
So I mean, you, you really like that. I just I just worry about his short game. His around the green game is really bad. And yes, while he did make the cut last week, he was really bad over the weekend. It finished somewhere, I think, around 50th. I like Connors more than Luke List. But I'm not in love. And 17% and at least per Fantasy National. 12% per game source. If it was 12%, I'd be much more... Um, I would stomach Corey Connors much more at 12%. 17%, kind of, no, not really. I'd be much rather play Chris Kirk. Look at his course value. Look at how well he's played here in the past. 14% here, only 10% per Gabe Source. So at 7,800, I would just much rather play Chris Kirk, even though the uh, FNGC rank wasn't nearly as high on Kirk. Sixth in irons. He's also really darn good on this surface. Par fours are fine. I, I would much rather play Chris Kirk in that regard. How do I feel about Nap? Look, I was just wrong last week. I, I'll admit it. Uh, I really thought he would have the winner's hangover. He played exceptionally well. Uh, it's hard for me because he's got so few stats. He's getting hurt by the fact that since he's never played this course, this number is kind of arbitrarily high. I don't hate it. I do worry about a little bit of fatigue, considering he won and then was in contention again last week. I do worry a little bit about fatigue, but, I mean, falls right in the middle in this elite field already in terms of purely by the numbers. 12%. Per Gabe source, 14% per Fantasy National. So so not as unique as I would like him to be. But, man, he's he's in fuego right now. No doubt about that. I actually don't hate it. I like it a lot more than Connors and List. I'll, I'll say that if he is minimum price on Yahoo. I like him I like him a lot more than Connors and List, depending on, you know, price. Uh, moving into the low sevens, uh, always think about Adam Scott. I know this course value isn't all that high, but he generally plays Bay Hill pretty darn well. You see the off the tee when it's difficult. Top 15 still in irons. Top 10 in par fours. So take a long look at Adam Scott. He's just not as unique as you might think. 12 and a half for Gabe Source, 16% here. At Fantasy National, okay. Keegan, getting a lot of love for good reason. This is more chalk I'll eat in the low sevens. Uh, Keegan's been fantastic here at Bay Hill. Top 10 off the tee. Top 15 in irons. The broomstick putter has been working for him. He's very good with his 200 plus irons as well, his long irons. So I really like Keegan this week, but a lot of people do. Just understand that um, you're going to have to find your uniqueness elsewhere if you're using Keegan Bradley. Um, Tony made a very good observation on Harris English. And he was popping a whole lot uh, in these in the top tens when we were looking at various metrics across um, things on Monday night. And you see he's played pretty well here in the past five years. Harris English only at 10% per Gabe Source, 14% per Fantasy National. Um, it's all about the short game for Harris English. The par threes, he's been very good, but second in putting on this surface. Gosh dang it, just off your screen, of course. Second in putting. Around the green's actually been pretty good too. Takes advantage of the par fives, which you have to do here. So I don't I I don't hate Harris English either. I wish he was a little bit more unique, but is what it is with a very small field. Um, Harris English should be good. Um, I'm actually going to use quite a bit of Ricky based, again, solely on the fact that he's played well here because you see the analytic numbers uh, pretty middling on him. He's just been very – he's been good here in the past five years, and he's very unique. So I'll, that's probably where I'm going to take a chance. 
I'm not in love with it by any means, but it's it's a play on the uniqueness and the fact that he's been good here. Luke List, this is, you know, again, elite world ball striker, no doubt about it, but you see how poorly he has played Bay Hill in the past five years. Not only is the putter really bulky, around the green is really bad, so if he is having a slightly off iron week, it's going to be really, really bad for him. He also doesn't get a lot of birdies when it's difficult. And he doesn't avoid a lot of bogeys when it's difficult. He just generally, I know he play, I know he won the Farmers. But that's why he just doesn't generally pop in majors. Because when it's difficult, he, he can, I don't know. I just, I just don't feel it this week. You're right, he will be unique. 9% per Fantasy National, only 6% per Gabe Source. So for those three, and again, I don't know if Jake Knapp is minimum priced on Yahoo or not, but I would go Knapp, Connors, because of how well he's played. Um, Bay Hill in the past, again, I just, I am cautious because he has not played Bay Hill all that well. And then moving into the 6Ks, look, I, there's really not a lot down here that I want to, to recommend to you all. Um, I'm trying to avoid the 6Ks as much as possible. Um, Grio, maybe, because he's been acceptable here, but you see 60th out of 69 players in terms of the numbers. Lost uh, for Nap and Kitty. Lost. Swap. Oh, swapped English and List for Nap and Kitiyama. I don't hate it. Um, I mean, Kitiyama's got that great course value because he's only played it once and he won. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not in love with Kitiyama, but I don't hate it. I really, really do like Nap compared to List for that. what that's worth. But in, here in the 6Ks, there's just not a lot I want to recommend. Like, again, Grio, he's been okay here. The Irons have been bad since his win last year. Um, at the Byron Nelson. I mean, he's got a lot of red, I mean, just deep red statistics. So if you're playing Grio, it's a play on the fact that he's been acceptable at Bay Hill in the past. Patrick Rogers has also been acceptable at Bay Hill in the past, but much like Grio, he's got a lot of things that are deep red. So I'm not, not in love with that either. I've been trying to avoid the 6Ks as much as possible. Everyone seems to be gravitating to Minlu Lee. Look, 69th out of 69 players. Horrible. And I mean just horrible course value. If it was only one time, I'd say, okay, he you can understand. He had a bad week. It happens. He's 0 for 2 and just horrendous both times here at Bay Hill. I understand he's coming off a fantastic week. He's probably a better player now than what he was when he played Bay Hill those past couple of times. I don't want any part of Min Woo Lee. This is the biggest fade that I can I can recommend. Uh, and if he plays well, I'll lose. But I'm going to have literally zero Min Woo Lee. Don't want any part of it. Glover or Hoagie? I'm going to take Hoagie. Um, Glover, while the ball striking has been okay, he's been mediocre-ish at Bay Hill. I, just, I don't I don't like the fit here. I generally try to look at Glover when it's uh, shorter and easier, kind of like JT Poston. You see the par fives, which you have to take advantage of here. Not, not particularly strong. Yes, the broom, broomstick putter has helped him out quite a bit, but he also doesn't go get birdies often when it's low. So I've, I've just got some concerns around Glover. I'd much rather go to Tom Hoagie um, of those two. Just understand Hoagie's going to be a little bit more popular. At least with Fantasy National, he's a lot more popular. He's actually only 6.5% per Gabe source. So even if you split the two, sitting right around 10%, I don't think that's horrible. You're getting a, a top-level iron player and the best 200-plus iron player in that regard. And Hoagie's not a great putter, but he's at least been even decent 
on this surface. So I would go Hoagie pretty comfortably over Glover of those two. But like I said, in the 6Ks, just don't want... I'm trying to avoid this as much as possible. It's another reason why I'm going to Cantley as opposed to Scheffler and Rory more often. I just don't like, like a lot down here. Van Royen would probably be fine, but I mean, he's at 10% per game source and 14.5% per Fantasy National. Minwoo Lee, 11.5% per Fantasy National, projected 25% per game source. Just, ugh, no. No, 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 no. And if he plays well, you can come back next week and tell me that I'm an effing idiot. That's fine. I accept that. I'm just willing to play the game theory. You've got too much to gain on your fellow contestants by not going to Minwoo Lee. All right. With that, that's how I see the price board and um, the where the potential pivots are, where our fellow contestants are going in terms of chalk. Let's start making some lineups here. We'll start with tiers, and then we'll 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 make classic lineups and, and figure out how we can um, skyrocket in our in our big GPPs. For those who play tiers contests, tier one you have Scotty, Rory, and Cantley. Much like in classic, I mean, I really think it's probably Patrick Cantley, just because these two are going to be so darn chalky. I really do think you're gaining a lot of uniqueness in tiers as well with Cantley. Um, Miss price at two when the minimum minimum is at is twenty. Um, uh, you're good with all that trap, yeah. Um, Taylor Moore, we didn't talk about him too much. I, okay, good with the long irons and very good on the surface putting, but eh, again, I just I'm not comfortable with it. Um. In Tier 1, I think I'm going to go with Cantley. It's really hard to pass Scotty. Really hard to pass Scotty, but I think I'm going to try to find uniqueness in Tier 1 right off the bat and go with Cantley. Tier 2, Hovland, Xander, Ludwig Ober, Jordan Spieth, Max Homa. For me, I want to, I want to take Homa and take a lot of the uniqueness as well. But because of how much uniqueness I think I gained with Cantley, let's just go with Hovland in Tier 2. I'm just I'm more confident in Hovland than I am in Homa. It's, it's, it's close. I'll go Hovland. Homa is very, very well, well worthwhile in Tier 2 as well. Tier 3, Sam Burns, Colin Morikawa, JT, Will Zalatoris, and Cam Young. Blah. Do not like Tier 3 at all. Uh, JT maybe, but I think... I think it's probably Cam Young. I just I don't like Sam Burns. I've talked about my hesitation with Morikawa here. I I mean I understand why people are gravitating to Zalatoris, but so just just give me Cam Young in tier three. I'll take the chalk. I don't like it, but it is what it is. Tier four: Tommy Fleetwood. Whoopsie, wrong way. Tommy Fleetwood, Fitzpatrick, Wyndham Clark, Hideki, Tom Kim, J Day, and Sung J. Pretty clear, Matt Fitzpatrick, no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, I don't think there's even a number two. It might go from one to like four. I just, I'm all about some Matt Fitzpatrick. Tier five, Sahith, Russell Henley, Poston, Pavone, Connors, Kirk, and Harmon. I do like Kirk quite a bit, but I think Tagala is pretty sneaky. I think it's one of those two. If you're willing to take the chance, it's Tagala. Because he's going to be, he's got the wider range of outcomes. I think he has a, a decent chance to win this. I can also see him shooting 77 84 and just imploding. He's got the widest range of outcomes. If you're comfortable with that risk, take Tagala. I think the safer play would be Kirk. So I'm going to take Tagala because I'm trying to hit the home run. I do not blame you one bit if you take Kirk. In Tier 6, we have Ricky, Bazaynut, Luke List, Ekro, Grio, Rose, and Hadwin. For me, it's between Ricky and Bazaynut. Both of these players have played Bay Hill fairly similarly in the past five years. I know Cbez rated out better, but I, I, this is just kind of a gut feeling. I'm going to go with Ricky 
in tier six. It's just kind of a gut feeling. So this tier's construction goes Cantley, Hovland, Cam Young, Fitzpatrick. Uh, tier five is Tagala, and tier six Ricky. All right, let's move to classic lineups. Figure out the lineups that our fellow contestants seem to be making and then how we can maneuver around that. So um, I'm going to start this. The, the first question basically has been Rory or Scotty. I'm going to go with Rory. Both of these players are at the exact same level of ownership per Gabe source. Almost 30%, literally no difference between them. So I'm going to go with Rory only because Fantasy National has him slightly more than Scotty. Could very easily be Scotty here. And then everyone's going to Minwoo at the bottom. Coming off of his runner-up finish last week. I get it. I just don't want any part of it. So this is where our fellow contestants are going in these um, chalky lineups. Uh, looks like Obear could be in this as well. At least per Fantasy National. Uh, 17% per Gabe Source, but it looks like Rory, Ludwig Ober, um Doubtful that they have enough for Cameron Young. We can try it. I doubt it. Yeah, 7,300. Yeah, that'll work. Because here in the lower half of the sevens, um, Adam Scott could work. Keegan Bradley is going to be pretty popular. Harris English has been popular. Now, Hoagie is very popular per Fantasy National. Not so much per Gabe Source. So, uh, if we try to combine both of them, like Keegan Bradley is definitely in this. He is 14% at both, or actually 17% per Fantasy National, 14% per Gabe Source. Leaves them at 7,200. Um, not a whole lot in there per Gabe Source now. Fantasy National, everyone's going to Tom Hoagie in that regard. So it depends on which source you want to believe. Fantasy National has them at 15%. Gabe Source only has it at 6%. But even so, this is looking like the chalky shell of a lineup. Um, you know, whether it's Rory or Scotty, Minwoo or Eric Van Royen, Keegan Bradley's in this. You know, maybe they come down off of Obear a little bit down to maybe a Wills Alatoris. Cam Young's getting a lot of attention. This is a chalky shell. You see 18%. That's gross. Don't want any part of that. There's nothing wrong with a lot of these players individually. I mean, I've talked about Hoagie. I love Keegan Bradley this week. Cam Young's fine. I like Rory enough. But combining them all into the same lineup is going to be, is going to spell death. Uh, you're just not going to be able to separate from the rest of your fellow contestants. If they are going uh, balanced, I'm going to give them Xander because just, I'm just i just not nearly as high on Xander. Uh, Adam Scott is in here as well. Uh, Try to bottom him out at Keegan. Uh, Adam Scott at 75. Let's see, Jake Knapp, 14 and 12. So Jake Knapp could absolutely be in this as well. Uh, trying to build them just a, you know, a kind of a balanced lineup here. Will Zalatoris is, what, 17 and a half per Fantasy National. Only 11 and a half, so not as much. Again, this would be like Cameron Young and uh, 9,000 is JT. So if you want to believe the fantasy national portion, it's it's Will's Altoris. So there's a look at a, perhaps a balanced build, chalky build, uh, going to Keegan and Adam Scott and Jake Knapp, you know, hovering in that mid seven area, maybe a couple eights and then uh, a high nine. Victor Xander, Obear. So there's a look at a couple of chalky lineups um, that I think will be very popular um, types of constructions. How are we going to maneuver around that? Well, for me, again, I've been going to Patrick Cantley, and him by himself is not, you know, terribly unique. 13% Fantasy National, 14 and a half 
per Gabe source. But again, it's the fact that you're gaining, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 percent uniqueness off of the main two. And I'm still confident that Patrick Cantley is going to play well here. He might not have the extreme upside that Scheffler or Rory does, but I don't see him missing the cut. You know, famous last words. I don't see him cratering to a, you know, a, top, a 40th place finish. I know he's not popular, but he just he, he should be pretty good. And I've been backing it up with Victor. That's where I've been trying to gain my win equity on on fellow contestants is going Cantley Hovland, Cantley Ludwig, Cantley Spieth even. Max Homa could absolutely fit in this. Um, I would like to try to fit Matt Fitzpatrick in this. You're not going to be able to, especially since I don't like much in the 6Ks at all. I've been trying to avoid it as much as possible. So because of that, I have not been able to go to Matt Fitzpatrick as much as I wanted to. But I've been bottoming out at Ricky. Been doing uh, Keegan. I know he's popular, but I'm just confident again in Keegan Bradley since he's played exceptionally well here year over year. Um, let's see. Ben On's getting some attention as well. Chris Kirk would absolutely fit in this. Um, you know, Connors at 78, I don't really want any part of. You know, that's honestly a pretty good shout on Jake Knapp. I hadn't thought about Jake Knapp, Darnell, but it could work. Again, I, I do worry a little bit about uh, about some fatigue. And he's the fact that he's never played Bay Hill, it didn't stop Kitayama from, from winning last year. But generally speaking, uh, it doesn't go well for first-time players. But those are the kind of lineups that I've been trying to build. Like Cantley Hovland, Cantley Spieth. Like if I, if I go more balanced, um, I'll go like Spieth. Um, Fleetwood probably going to be fine. Maddie Fitzpatrick, who I'm just all about again this week. Moving on down into the bottom of the eights, like Sahit Tagala, I think is going to be pretty darn sneaky good this week. Sung Jay could be worthwhile based on you know his excellent history here. So you're 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 going on. History versus recent form. And then again, rounding this out how you see fit. You know, Keegan, Jake Knapp, maybe like an Adam Scott, maybe like a Matthew Pavone could be interesting. I don't really want any part of Siwoo or Brian Harmon. Again, depending on how I'm thinking, it's like it's either Ricky, maybe Christian Bazadenhut, but I'm much more comfortable using Ricky. Then 81, again, is like Sahith, but I could go Russell Henley. Pretty unique. You know, that's a sub-11% lineup there that, again, a little speculative with Tagala, but I think he's, he's, he's going to be pretty darn good. And all of these players, all of these players have been very good in the past at Bay Hill, which is an important factor. And don't forget, Sahith Tagala did top 15 this last year. So there's a look at a couple of the lineups, that uh, types of lineups that I've been building. I'll stick around for a couple of minutes if anyone else has any questions. Um, poll question. Uh, looks like um, when there are two tournaments, how much attention do you pay to the alternate uh, event? Uh, very little, which is understandable considering, you know, not a lot of the bigger names are there or none of the bigger names are there. Um, and the DFS contests are generally uh, pretty weak. In terms of prize payouts, uh, clearly for me, I'm a degenerate and I'm a uh, masochist, so I'm about all about the statistics. So if there was a category above a lot, that would be me. I pay a, a tremendous amount of attention to the alternate field event. Um, my one and done for the week, I am kind of waffling back and forth, but right now I've clicked in Matt Fitzpatrick. Um, I am justifying that with saying that this is a signature event because a lot of times I would save a player of Matt Fitzpatrick's caliber for a major, particularly a U.S. Open or a PGA Championship. But um, it's just hard to ignore his previous 
uh, performance at Bay Hill with this being a you know signature event, a very uh, minimal cut event. I'm pretty confident in Fitzpatrick's performance. So that's where I'm at right now in terms of one and done. I could maybe see going to Spieth, maybe see going to Cantley, but right now I've got Fitzpatrick clicked in. That looks like it's going to be it for the show tonight. I want to thank P and Darnell and Tony for jumping in chat. Much appreciated. Um, uh, love what I do. Uh, talk, taking a look at sports statistics. Uh, giving you a statistician's uh, view of what he sees. Trying to win, help us all win a little bit of money in the process. Thanks again to you three for jumping in chat and participating. I always appreciate it. And thanks to everyone else out there who tunes in, watches, listens, supports the channel by liking the videos, commenting, and subscribing. It helps me out a lot when you do that. Uh, so I'm very appreciative of the support. For all of the wagers that you've made this week for the Arnold Palmer Invitational, for all of the DFS contests you play for the Arnold Palmer Invitational, for all of the wagers and contests you play for the Puerto Rico Open, for this weekend and every weekend, may all your bets be profitable.